Hello and welcome everybody to our second episode on how to cast out demons. So today I'm going to be doing a brief overview of the formula that the Bible sets forth on how to be free from Satan's dominion. And this is a very simple formula. Pretty much anybody who does deliverance biblically will follow the same formula. Any method or, or what have you when it comes to bringing people freedom from the devil, they will all follow the same biblical pattern. And we're going to be going over that today. So the biblical formula for deliverance is confession plus repentance plus expulsion equals deliverance or freedom or liberation, whatever term you happen to want to use. So the first point that we have on our formula is confession. So let's turn to James chapter 5 verse 16 and we will read this as our foundation for confession. Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So, so basically confession here, James is talking about as a key to bringing healing. Now the word here in Greek, healing, is the same word that can be translated salvation or deliverance. The Greek word is sozo. Some of you may be familiar with it. So pretty much the point of confession is to bring to light that which is in darkness. Now, some people believe that we don't need to really confess our sins to one another. We just need to repent, and that's fine. I, I disagree with that. At least when it comes to deliverance, I find getting things out in the open and to a brother or a sister is an invaluable part of deliverance. And confessing things to one another really destroys the shame instead of just holding it in and trying to keep it all secret. What it does is it brings it out in the light and it reveals Satan's schemes so that God can destroy it and get it out of your life. So if you look at Psalms 35, you see that David said, when I refused to confess my sin, I wasted away. And this is when he's talking about his sin of murder and adultery, that he held it in, he didn't say anything, it was a secret, and, and, and he, was, he was breaking down and inside and outside and everything was falling apart. But when he got it out in the open, God was able to heal him and deliver him from that sin. So confession is the first part. When you see some people do deliverance, Sometimes uh, we'll ask a question like, um, what is something that you're so ashamed of you swore you'd never tell anyone in your life? Or, or what are uh, some of the things that you are dealing with habitually? And the purpose of this isn't because a deliverance minister wants to get in your business, but because the confession will break the power of that thing. So it, it destroys the, the power of shame and guilt and it gets it out in the open. Confession also requires humility. When you say, I'm just going to deal with it myself, that's pride. And that's also going to be a barrier for deliverance. In my own life, when I was struggling with um, different kinds of lusts and perversions that were attacking me when I was in high school, I remember praying and asking God, what is it I need to do to be free? And he told me I needed to confess it. And I said, oh, no, no, I don't need to do that. I can handle it myself. And a year went by and I was in the same situation that I was when I started with. And I finally repented of my pride and had the humility to begin confessing it and asking for help. Now, I didn't get free at that time, but that was the first step that, I, that was required for deliverance, was confessing it and bringing it out in the open. And when I was able to do that, that was able to get pride out of the way, that was able to get shame out of the way, and that was what was able to open the door for God's deliverance. On pages 141 and 142 of the Handbook of Spiritual Warfare by Dr. Murphy, it lists confession as a requirement of freedom. In these chapters specifically, he's talking about sexual sin, though this is applicable for anything that you need deliverance from. And he's talking about um, people going to a support group or talking to a brother or sister and bringing these things out in the open, confessing not only the sin, but confessing, hey, I may need help with prayer. I may need you to just support me in this time because I'm having a difficult time as somebody is working out their deliverance. This is very important because God did not create us to be lone ranger Christians where we're just hit us and Jesus and that's it. He created us to be in communion with one another as brothers and sisters. So we get our, our, our vertical relationships correct and we get our horizontal relationships with the brothers and sisters correct. And that's when we're in divine alignment for deliverance. So the second point of our formula is repentance. Now this should not be very difficult for people to understand. Repentance is all over the New Testament. I, I do want to point out the Greek word for repentance is metanoia and it means to have a change of mind and heart about something. 
Now, many people have the idea when you get saved, you just say, Jesus, I'm sorry for everything. And, and amen, I give me my eternal life insurance. And that's not what repentance is. Repentance is very specific. When John the Baptist was asked by various sinners around Judea, what must I do to be saved? He said, you soldiers repent of your coercion and you tax collectors repent of taking more than you're supposed to and so on and so forth. He was very specific about your repentance. Renounce this specific sin. So when we're in deliverance, we want repentance to be as specific as possible. If there was a habitual sin that led to a demonic problem, we want to repent for that. And we don't want to just repent for some kind of general, vague, uh, something related to that, but we want to be specific about it and turning away from whatever's in our lives. Now, we don't have to go crazy with that, but repentance and changing your mind about something specific, and changing your mind about something specific is very important. And we want to, we want to honor God's word and we want to get in divine alignment. And what repentance does is you're turning away from sin, you're renouncing the devil, and you are then putting yourself in God's camp. Repentance is like a systematic surrender of your life to God. So when you repent for one area, that means you are taking that area out of the dominion of Satan and you are surrendering it to the Lordship of Jesus. And you do this for specific areas. You may say, Lord, I, I throw my life down, I give it all to you, but then you turn around and you're um, addicted to pornography and you're addicted to gluttony and you're angry and you're having bitter outbursts, then your words of, I surrender all don't really mean anything because you're practically not surrendering to Jesus. Practically surrendering means taking each area of your life where your uncrucified flesh is ruling and saying, I turn away from this sin and I am surrendering it to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, you may not be free from that sin immediately. You may go back to it or you may still struggle with it, but you're making a act of your will to turn away from it and to, to surrender it to the Lordship of Jesus. And over time, the work of the Holy Spirit will bring you freedom from that area. The early church had this idea when it came to repentance, and this is in the document Shepherd of Hermas, which is a early second century document that basically described the mind and the soul as having real estate, pretty much. And certain areas of the mind were surrendered and occupied by the Holy Spirit, and certain areas were not surrendered to the Lord, and they were occupied by demonic spirits. And over time, the Christian or individual would either choose to surrender more real estate to the Holy Spirit, or they would surrender less real estate to the Holy Spirit. And, and in that case, eventually their mind would become overwhelmed by demonic activity, and they would basically become a, a raging demoniac. But there was this concept of there are areas that are surrendered to Christ and there are areas that are not surrendered to Christ. And this is this back and forth. And our goal is to get as much real estate surrendered to Christ as possible. Now, that was a concept that the early church had, and that's biblical. And that's what we want to do today. We want to examine our lives in deliverance. And we want to say, this is where I need to surrender to Christ and make a, de and make a, a detailed and precise decision to surrender a certain area of your life to Christ. And we want to do this with all the areas of our lives, but specifically targeting those areas which we're struggling with sin or, or whatever it may be, and repenting for specific actions. Now, part of the reason repentance is important in deliverance is because when you boil it down, pretty much any demonic activity that is involved in somebody's life came from sin at somewhere, at some point in time. Now, that sin may have been the person who is being demonized, the individual who's receiving deliverance may have been involved in sin, or somebody who had authority over them, like a parent or what have you, may have been involved in sin, and that led to demonization. Or somebody may have sinned against this individual, and this individual may have been traumatized somehow. In, in whatever point there is, if there's demonic activity, somewhere at some point there is sin. It may not always be the person who is fallen victim to the demons, but there is always sin if there are demons there. And that's why repentance is very important because we want to repent. We want to throw the sins out. We want to cover them by the blood of Jesus so that we are in, in legal right standing with God. And that leaves the way for God to bring a complete deliverance. Now that brings us to our last point, which is expulsion. Now many so-called deliverance ministries or inner healing or what have you, they go through something like this where they confess things and they repent for them and they say a prayer or a form prayer that is basically renouncing things. And that's all fine, but they come to the point where they say amen and that's it. And the individual is not free. And the reason is because through confession and repentance, you have come to the place where you are a candidate for deliverance, but you have not actually cast the demons out that are causing the problem. You can repent 
all day long, but if you refuse to actually cast out the intruder in your life, then the intruder is still gonna be there. So we come to expulsion. Now expulsion is very simple. Just like confession and repentance, expulsion is very simple. It's not complicated at all. All it is is taking authority over a demon and commanding it to leave in the name of Jesus. And if it doesn't leave the first time, saying it again and forcing the demon to leave. Now, some people, they will go through some kind of form of deliverance of confession and repentance or what have you. And they'll say, in the name of Jesus, you spirits go. Amen, brother, you're free. Well, sometimes that works and sometimes that doesn't. Typically, when you're seeing a demon get cast out, there will be some kind of physical manifestation. The person will cough, yawn, uh, scream, uh, start thriving or manifesting a, some kind of manifestation as the demon is leaving. Because we see in the New Testament, every time Jesus casts out a demon and every time one of Jesus' exorcisms are recorded, there is some kind of physical manifestation. He never just said, leave in the name of Jesus and the person was just magically delivered and nothing happened. There was always a physical sign that everybody around him knew what Jesus was doing. He was casting out a demon. So if you don't see a physical manifestation when you get to this point, I would say that you need to maybe push a little bit more until there's sufficient evidence that a spirit has left. And we will get into uh, more on that in later episodes on when we come to the different methods of casting out demons. But leave it at this, that we don't want to just stop at confession or repentance, but we want to cast it out. And when we cast it out, there will probably be very clear that something has left. Either the person will feel it or everybody else will be able to see it. So that is the biblical formula for deliverance. We have confession, we have repentance, and we have kicking the demons out. Anybody who practices deliverance biblically will be following a method like this. They will lead the person through confession and repentance, and then they will cast the demon out. Now, there are a lot of different ways that this may look, and we are going to get into these different ways in the next episode. But for now, let's just concise to say that this is the biblical method. And I will add one bonus point to the end of this formula. And that is filling an individual with the Holy Spirit. Now, you can cast out demons with confession and repentance and not get to fill them with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. However, um, with FBI Christ and Church Sitkanu, and in my own experience, I've found that if you want to see lasting results in deliverance, or if you want a person to have a holistic deliverance, that you're really helping them out, you're not just casting demons out, then having the baptism of the Holy Spirit is an imperative in somebody's life. Because Jesus says that if a spirit is cast out, it will wander through dry places, and it will return to the house from which it left, and it will say, I want to go home, I want to return to my house, and it will take with it seven more spirits more wicked than itself. It'll find the house empty, swept, and put in order, and then it'll come in, and the last state of the man will be worse than the first. And now that may have been a little bit of a paraphrase, but suffice to say, if the house is empty, and there's no occupant, then the demons are going to come right back. And that's one of the reasons why we're very hesitant with casting demons out of unbelievers is because what's going to happen? Are they going to have lasting freedom and come to Christ or are they going to just decide to go back to the world and then be filled with seven times worse? So whenever we do a deliverance, at least in FBI Christ or um, anytime I do a deliverance or a church to canoe, generally the protocol is we want to fill the individual with the Holy Spirit. If they're not baptized in the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues, we will pray for them to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And if they are, we will just lead them through um, arts, form prayer of Holy Spirit, baptize and fill me with your fire, 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 and <sighs> as a sign of, of filling the Holy Spirit in the areas that have been vacated by demons. So, I will say that this is probably an important part that we want to include in deliverance, but there are plenty of deliverance ministries that successfully uh, get people free without doing something white like that. But I, I believe it is biblical in that we should be doing that. So anyways, to conclude, that is the biblical formula for deliverance. It is confession, repentance, expulsion, and as a bonus point, fill them with the Holy Spirit. And when you have that, you will have a holistic and a free life. And now there's a lot of ways to do that. There's a lot of uh, different approaches. And anything that does it pretty much that way, I would say, is a biblical method of deliverance. There are some people who do other ways, and there are some people who uh, don't do it like I do, but they still follow this method. I would say this is the realms of the Bible, so this is, we want to stick to something like this. And we're going to get into different ways this can look next week, but for now, you guys have a blessed day.